and thank you for coming. I am a master gardener and I finished my course in 2018. It had been something on my bucket list since I retired. Um, most of my career was in medical and geriatric social work. I'm a native New Yorker and uh, moved here to a totally different country about 15 years ago. Uh, at the end of the Master Gardener training, you're required to do a presentation to the entire class. Uh, this is what I chose and it worked out. So I've been doing it ever since for our Speakers Bureau. Uh, we're going to have a question period in the middle and probably and one at the end. And if you have any issues with your the technical issues, you can uh, type in the chat and Taylor will try and help you. So you're all muted and your videos are turned off. Um, use the Q&A icon to the host, that's Taylor. And I think you've already received or you will be receiving a link to complete a survey from uh, University of California. If you choose to complete the survey, you will get a handout of uh, resources regarding plant bee lists and how to create to repeat how to create a pollinator garden. So let's go from here. Uh, our the mission of the UC Master Gardener program is to extend research-based knowledge and information on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable landscaping practices to the residents of Contra Costa County and beyond. So let's go to creating a pollinator garden. What I'm going to do is first talk about who are the pollinators, where are they, uh, why are they struggling, and then we'll have a break and go into the steps to create a pollinator garden. So why do we need pollinators? Well, the goal of all plants is to reproduce, whether they realize it or not, and in order to do that, almost all need the help of pollinators. Pollinators help by moving pollen from the anthers of the flower to the stigma of the same flower or another flower of the same type. This process of fertilization results in fruits, vegetables, and flowers. And about a third of our food has been pollinated. So let's look what that might be at the grocery store. So this is the produce section uh, with pollinators. And on the right is the produce section without pollinators. And it's hard for me to see, but I think we're missing apples, could be limes, potatoes. I don't know what this was, but you get the idea. Pollinators need plants for nectar and pollen, flowers and fruits, vegetables. Producing plants need pollinators to reproduce and humans need fruits and veg to survive. Imagine what a smoothie would be without pollinators, which would be a large glass of ice. Guacamole would be lime juice and salt, and spaghetti marinara would just be spaghetti and salt. So why are the pollinator populations declining? What's happened? Habitat destruction due to construction. Subdivisions on the right sprawling throughout the East Bay. Commercial development. Many of you, not me, but many of you may remember what the East Bay looked like 15 or more years ago, very different place than it does now, destroying the habitat for our bees and pollinators. Broad spectrum pesticide use in the garden, on the farm, and in the orchard. As master gardeners, our goal is to avoid pesticide use if we can. If we have to use a pesticide, we try to use the least toxic most specific pesticide with the greatest effect. Uh, here we go. Other factors, the introduction of non-native plants and insects, which force out our native plants and insects. Light pollution, uh, the ambient light over cities and towns can disturb the flight path of the moth. Climate change may cause a geographic change in a pollinator's range, which is happening now here. And diseases affecting both native and non-native bees. I don't know if you've heard of colony collapse disorder, 
that has been ongoing now for quite some time. I, I think I'm unsure whether the latest um, research indicates that it's caused to the Varroa mite or to pesticides. Uh, the neonicotinoids are the most damaging to native bees and non-native bees, or it's a combination of both, but the disease goes on. Uh, okay, into pollination. This is sort of like basic botany 101 and I'm not a botanist, but on the left is a photo of some kind of a lily uh, with the anthers in brown surrounded by pollen and the stigma sticking up in the middle. Um, so the, the pollen from the anthers needs to get to the top of the stigma. It's, here's the anther and here's the pollen. It's got to get to the top of the stigma in order to get down this column to the ovary where fertilization takes place. So the flowers come, um, the flowers have the nectar, which the bees want, the hummingbirds and the butterflies want. So they come for the nectar, but in the process of coming, their bodies touch the pollen. They move around the flower, they rub against the stigma, pollen drops off into the bottom. <clears throat> So what kinds of pollination do we have? Self-pollination, where a pistil of the same flower collects pollen. So it all takes place in one flower. This could be from wind. Or cross-pollination. Bee is here, picks up pollen, flies over to another flower, and pollinates here. Well, it's just giving you a little heads up that we can't really see your cursor, so um, a little oh, more. Oh, okay. Sorry about cursor. that. Okay, yeah, I'll just. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, we'll just uh, talk it through then. So here's an example of pollination uh, going from one plant to another. Squash flowers are male or female. So on the left we have a male squash flower. That's the anther. That that fuzzy piece there. Uh, bees picking up pollen and then flying over to a female squash flower and pollinating. <clears throat> if you find that your squash are not producing squash, it may be that you're not having many squash bees come into your flowers. So this, um, I'll say gentleman, has taken a stamen and an anther and put it to the stigma of a female plant. And the other option is to use uh, a paintbrush where you take pollen from the male and apply it to the female plant. And honeybees are not helpful with squash flowers um, because the male flowers bloom before the honeybee is active in the morning. Honeybees fly from the female flower to the female flower later in the day, carrying no pollen. Oops. But competing with the squash bees for the nectar. Squash bees are our little heroes. They fly earlier than the honeybee while the male flower is still blooming. Wind pollination, this is corn. The pollination goes from one plant to the other and lands on the silks of another plant. Um, corn and other cereal grains like wheat, Oats, barley, rye, and rice are usually wind pollinated, as well as nut producing trees like walnuts, pecans, and pistachios. The buzz pollination is kind of my favorite. <clears throat> this happens with tomatoes, tomatillos, eggplant potatoes and peppers. The anthers which produce the pollen are fused together. Unlike that lily that we saw earlier where everything was easy access, they're fused together with a little tiny opening at the top. Those uh, black and green arrows at, at the white picture are pointing um, to that area. You can see, I'm sorry about the uh, pointer, but they're closed. So the basic bee can't get at it. So th that small slit is the only way that the pollen can exit. So 
a bumblebee or some other native bees who are heavier, they land here on the bottom picture on the right. The weight of the bee turns the blossom upside down. Then they use their flight muscles, not to fly, but to agitate their body so that the pollen shakes out. And then they move again throughout the flower, uh, dropping the pollen into the stigma. Pretty interesting. So who and where are the pollinators? So here we are in North America, the lime green indicates bees. You can see that half of our pollination is done by bees. Then we move to Central America where, surprise to me, um, the majority of pollination is done by bats, birds, and, and uh, bees share the rest of that. South America, it's bees again. Also Europe. Then it's split in Africa between birds and bees. And in Asia, bees and uh, flies, which doesn't sound too pleasant. And uh, in Australia, New Zealand, birds, flies, and bees. So half of our pollinators are bees. Here we are with the animal pollinators, starting with the honeybee, whom we all know. The honeybee is a social bee, living in a hive year round. It was imported to us in the 1600s, coming into Virginia. Uh, it, show, it first shows up on a register of um, goods that are coming into America. Over time, it became farmed as an agricultural pollinator. These crops require, oh, sorry. Uh, California's almond crop is the largest honeybee management event in the world, using nearly 1 million hives. Honeybee lives in hives and bumblebees live in colonies. Bumblebees are, although, well, bumblebees live in colonies and are also social. The aggressiveness of the bee, the honeybee and the bumblebee is due to their need to defend the colony. They sting once and then they die. But opposed to the social bees are native bees, which up until I took my course, I didn't even know they existed. The California bee is the only social bee among the native bees. There are 20,000 species of native bees in the world, 4,000 species in the US. <clears throat> and 1,600 species living in California. 70% of them nest in the ground. The other 30% nest in cracks and crevice, crevices in nature, uh, perhaps in a uh, uh, a rocky um, wall, they could tuck right in there and lay their eggs. Um, mason bees, which you may or may not have heard of, are the first native bees to come out in the spring. When the first uh, fruit trees open with the blossoms, that's when the mason bees are with us for maybe four to six weeks. California bumblebee is the most common in California. And only about four species of bumblebees in the US are somewhat aggressive. Here are some examples of other native bees in our area. I think we've all seen a carpenter bee. Uh, here's the leaf cutter who takes um, maybe half moon shapes, cuts them out of leaves and builds a little, um, if you will, case for in which to lay one egg after another. The longhorn bee on the upper right, the bottom or the green sweat bee, which is very common. And then another carpenter bee called the valley bee in orange. And then a digger bee, which is one of the native bees that digs in the ground. There are also flies. Um, the serpent, this is a serpent fly and it's often mistaken for a bee, but if you were able to get close enough, you would see that it only has one set of wings. Whereas um, native bees and 
honeybees have two sets of wings. There's the green bottle fly, which we all know. And then the poor sweet lady beetle, not very efficient. She flies, uh, falls off plants and flowers very easily. Their habitat requirements are the same as those that satisfy bees and butterflies. Uh, they nest in dying trees, soil, leaf litter, litter, decaying wood, and other rotting materials. Butterflies and moths. Here's the monarch, upper left, upper right, the swallowtail, the bottom left, the painted lady, and the bottom right, the gulf fritillary or the passion flower butterfly. I had an opportunity to be in Monterey County this spring and in Pacific Grove, they have a monarch butterfly um, reserve habitat and which had not been doing well in previous years. Um, suddenly it was inundated with monarchs. So I don't know what happened this spring, but they were seeing more monarchs than, than they've seen in years, <clears throat> which I think is a good sign. And let's hope that it continues. Hummingbirds. Here are some interesting facts about honeybirds. They're the smallest migrating bird. They don't migrate in flocks, but travel alone for up to 500 miles at a time. They're the only bird that can fly backward. Their average weight is less than a nickel, and their legs are pretty much useless except for clinging on at my hummingbird feeder. They only lay two eggs, and they use stretchy material, often spider web, for nest materials that can expand as the babies grow. There are over 330 species of hummingbirds in North and South America. Some of the most common in our area are the annas on the upper left, which is with us all the time and constantly at my feeders. The allens on the upper right comes north, the earliest in the spring. And then on the bottom left is the rufus, which looks to the layperson and to the naked eye almost identical to the Allens, very hard to distinguish in the field. The Rufus is extremely aggressive. And then we have the black chinned, which I think I may have only seen once in the last 15 years. This is uh, one of my hummingbird feeders in my backyard. Just want to review a few requirements for them. The ratio for the feeder solution is one part white granulated sugar dissolved in four parts boiling water. For example, that would mean one cup of water to a quarter cup sugar. Only use white granulated sugar. Don't use organic sugar. Don't use brown sugar. Don't use um, confectioner sugar. Just straight old sugar. And for heaven's sakes, do not use that store-bought red solution or the powder that you can buy to make a red solution. They don't need the artificial red. They're coming to the feeder because it's red. And it's important to keep your feeder cleaned with a 10% bleach solution when it gets moldy. This particular moldy, uh, this particular uh, feeder gets moldy a lot because it's in a very hot location uh, and sugar and heat uh, tends to get the mold going. So for the bleach solution, what nine parts water to one part bleach. I don't do it on a regular basis. I do it when I see that mold has grown. So uh, let's stop here, Taylor, and see if you have any questions. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. It's been really good so far. I like seeing all the, the bugs and the birds and things and kind of interacting and knowing that they're around the area. Because I've definitely seen a lot of them, but some of those hummingbirds are really cool looking. I, I see very mainly cool. the, the one with the green chest very often around my place. Yeah. Um, they're really pretty. But uh, let's start with near the beginning. You're talking about um, hand pollination and people doing that sometimes. And I was wondering how much do you feel that uh, average gardeners in their in their backyard should worry about like 
having to hand pollinate some of their plants or should they just be letting the regular pollinators do it or like for average gardeners? You would, you would start by seeing if you're getting any fruit. If you're not getting any fruit, then if you really feel diligent, you can go and try and do hand pollination. Um, mm -hmm. I This year I have a, um, a determinant tomato growing in a pot and I have not seen one single bee doing any buzz pollination. I haven't seen a bee near it of any type. So I have been out there sort of shaking, just sort of shaking, shaking, shaking. It is very windy where I live, so that's a possibility, but I, from what I've read about tomato, um, the way the, the stigma and the, uh, all of that is, it's not likely that wind is gonna do that. But I have tomatoes, so something's happened, and I, yeah. I'm attributing it to the fact that I went out and shook a lot. Just sort of. I heard that the little bit of the shake behind it. I've also heard um, people sometimes use like uh, like a electric toothbrush or something. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that too. Yeah, and it kind of creates a little vibrating behind it, and I always thought that was interesting because I I also know um, the manzanitas and all the Ericaceae family plants that have the little bell flowers. Mm -hmm. They're very heavily in the buzz pollination where they need the vibration to to get the pollen moving around, and I always exactly. thought that was super cool. So I would suggest giving it a chance, see if you're getting any fruit developing. If not, mm -hmm. um, this would be really tedious if you had an acre of tomatoes, but yeah. if you just have a few plants in your backyard, I think it could be done. Yeah, and then this is generally talking about uh, plants that you're looking to get the fruits out of them, because if you have daisies and other kinds of just flowering plants, you're not too worried about uh, fruit, them. No. Yeah, from making the fruit. Um, also, I guess even on that same note, a uh, question that I have is, how often do you let your plants or do you feel like plants should go fully to seed? Or I know that we often recommend deadheading to increase the blooming site, like the season of blooms, but sometimes letting it go to seed near the end can also be good. Um, I deadhead. You know, I, I have to confess, and I told you earlier today, I don't grow vegetables. I'd rather go to the farmer's market and get them, but mm -hmm. I do grow ornamentals um, and I deadhead all the time. Yeah. Um, if that's what you're asking me about ornamentals. I think so. It's just like, yeah, a lot of people um, will be nervous about, you know, trimming the plants and stuff, but deadheading is pretty important to increase the blooming cycle. But I also know that sometimes near the end of the season, if you let them go to seed, if you don't mind the seeds spreading oh, around for the end, for the, yeah, yeah, for the, yeah. For the, for the for birds and stuff, right? Yeah, overwintering or even letting the birds have some seeds to feed on in the winter. Um, it's an interesting kind of uh, transition there. Yeah, here where um, I live right now, the... Um, some of the lavender has already bloomed, so it's time to go out and prune that, and hopefully we'll get a second bloom out of that to keep the pollinators happy. So I do a lot of that interim in the middle of the summer after I've gotten my first full bloom. All right, well, I, as we were talking, we definitely have some more questions coming in, um, but I had someone asking about um, using pesticides and the, the harmful effects of those, especially ones like considering like Roundup or some of the ones that are um, a little bit more like that. The, how it can affect your, your garden and your pollinators. Oh, I, don't, don't put a pesticide. I would not put a pesticide anywhere near any vegetable that I was trying to grow. Um, what we do often is we start with something as simple if it's uh, uh, I don't, the little white ones, the little bugs. Uh, um, maybe white fly or mealy or aphids? Aphids, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, try and, we'll try and blow them off with water. Mm -hmm. Or frankly, it's not too gross. I take my finger and I just run it down. If it's not the whole plant that's infected, I'll just run my finger down and take off the aphids that are there, or I'll pick off mealybug. So that is like a minimal thing to do. But if you have a, the whole place has gone wild with mealybugs or aphids, um, if you have to get an insecticide, go to wherever you go and make sure it's something that's not going to kill 20 things but as few things as possible, the least, yeah. the most specific to your thing. Yeah, I talk with people quite often in our stores and definitely if you're if you're looking to go for more of the chemical route of getting past the slope gardens and, and talking to the staff, we can give you some tips on what the, which ones of the sprays are, like you said, a little bit more specific or won't be as effective to certain uh, pollinators as well as maybe some tricks about how to not affect pollinators, like spraying in the evening when they're not really as active and stuff like that is, is definitely important. But uh, we have a lot of those products here at our stores if you're interested. Yeah, a lot of them are uh, organic, hopefully. Uh, some yes, we, we really try and go towards all the organic ones and the ones that are not uh, super caustic or 
or very dangerous. So um, definitely it's a good conversation to have with the people that you're talking with or you're buying from, but we try and be a little bit safer with that stuff. Um, I have another one that's kind of shifting gears, but uh, someone was saying that their husband really likes solar lights in their garden and having a little more brighter lights at night. And they were wondering, is that going to be a problem for like moths and other kinds of pollinators that do nighttime pollination? Do the it lights could be because I, well, I, th the person in the audience would know whether moths are being attracted to those solar lights. I, I don't know about that. That's a different kind of, it's still mm -hmm. light. It, if there's a lot of no, moths fluttering around it, I would say perhaps that is bothering them. Yeah, I mean, it, it might be, I was actually thinking about that too, because I think a lot of times the light will attract the moths, which maybe will bring them to the garden, but maybe it'll just distract them. So I'm not sure. Um, I do see a lot of lighting in gardens at nighttime, though. So, um, maybe just don't yeah. have it on all night. <laughs> That's an interesting thought. Um, I, I like to put white flowering uh, plants in my garden because when you come out at night, that's all I can see. So if I can see white in the garden, that tells me that a moth could see white in the garden because moths are mainly uh, active at night. Yeah. Well, I have a picture um, of that later. Yeah, well, we have a couple more questions. We're definitely gonna be doing a lot more questions near the end. So we just kind of do a little brief uh, intermission here, but uh, someone's actually asking, um, using boiled water versus the filtered water for the feeder. You were kind of mentioning using boiled water, but would filtered water be, um effective or should you go for boiled i you know i don't know that it just whatever bacteria could be in tap water is why we're boiling so mm. I, that's a good question and i don't know the answer to that but everything i read says boil mm -hmm. yeah i think that's a good approach is maybe go for more of the the boiled might really take out some i mean you don't have problems. to boil it for 10 minutes uh, um just make sure that the sugar is dissolved and you're starting to get a, some bubbles around the side and i've never had any problem Cool. Um, and then I think we definitely have a couple more. I'm gonna uh, go through them and get some interesting uh, questions for later on, but maybe we'll move on into talking more about the, the pollinators. And okay, here, here's the like. second part where we talk about what you yeah. can do. Then some more questions if you have them. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you want to do is have a variety of plants because we have a lot of different pollinators and they all like different things. Um, Penstemon is a favorite in my garden. The bees like to climb inside that. It's like a little cup. They like to go in, pull the pollen out. S Salvia is a big hit. There's a, one in particular called uh, Hot Lips, uh, which is red and white. And this, I don't see any white on this one, but um, Hot Lips is a big attractor. And then this rosemary here, uh, I live in a homeowners association, and so there are a lot of restrictions on what we can do in what they call the common areas. However, that being said, many years ago, I bought a four inch rosemary, put it in my tiny garden, and it got too big. So I snuck out into the common area on the other side of my fence, and I put this small rosemary in the ground, and that's what it looks like today and even bigger. And the bees go nuts for it. It's one of the first things to bloom in the spring. And it's amazing how many bees it attracts. So a variety of plants continued. Here's this lavender, the bee coming in. Whoops. Gallardia, which I'll talk a little bit about later with a um, lady beetle. And then uh, this is a... Monarch on a, a Mexican sunflower. Different shapes, a variety. You can see how the uh, hummingbird likes to get inside that tube with the beak. Butterflies, the swallowtail likes the open platform of a zinnia because of those wings, it's easier to manipulate. And then on the Coreopsis, we've got a green sweat bee. Now, I was talking about white blossoms at night. This is uh, called white bower vine. Uh, my backyard is on the top of a hill. It's just extremely hot. I've got a um, bluestone patio, so that reflects the heat, plus the wooden fence all the way around. This white bower vine has gone ballistic. It just went wild. It seems to be able to tolerate deep, deep heat. Uh, its leaves are thick and glossy, and it puts out this um, grouping or cluster of beautiful white blossoms. 
So I think this is an example of something white in your garden at night to draw on the moths. And I think that star jasmine would be another uh, possibility for butterflies and bees during the day and moths during the night. Those of you that enjoy herbs, uh, you could certainly put together a few herbs or have an herb garden. Uh, basil, thyme, oregano, and sage, they all bloom. Also in this picture, I think I see uh, chives near the white piece of whatever that is in the middle of the picture. Uh, bee balm, I think is the red. And in the front, uh, the two white plants could be variegated sage, I'm not sure. But just about everything here is blooming. It's pretty, it's a nice thing to put together in your variety of plants to offer pollinators. You want plants of varying heights and colors. The back is lavender, in the middle is salvia, and down at the bottom, your Santa Barbara daisies. It's not only because it's easier for us to locate the pollinators, but it's easier for them to find what they're interested in if they can see it very clearly. But again, different colors. Different pollinators like different colors. Now, for those of you with vegetable gardens, you can uh, transfer that concept into your vegetable garden. For something tall, you could put sunflowers to attract pollinators, sort of mid-height echinacea or cornflower, and then the annuals marigolds for lower. So don't hesitate to put flowers that will draw pollinators into your vegetable garden. Uh, here's an example, another example. Way back here, if you can see the back middle of that photograph, sunflowers. In the middle right is our galardia. In the middle, it looks like marigolds, and I'm not sure what that is on the left in pink. And over here, you can see uh, this bed of flowers. At uh, our garden, our demonstration garden in Walnut Creek, I took a little survey and we were using um, parsley, basil, cosmos, marigolds, zinnias, sunflowers, and lavender. And we also have a special um, bed where we put pollinator plants. So you want to have a water source. Honeybees need the water. Um, but people ask me about mosquitoes. And as you may know, mosquitoes lay their eggs in water. So it's important to change the water regularly. In the summer, depending upon temperature, it takes about a week or two for an egg, a mosquito egg to grow to an adult. So I think if you change the water every five days or so, that would be sufficient to stop the life cycle. I personally just go out and take the hose and blast it whenever it's, I see the water is getting low. It blasts out whatever leaves have fallen in there, it cleans it out. Um, I don't take it in the house and bleach it, I just make sure there's fresh water. These stones are so that the uh, uh, honeybees have some place to, to land and they don't land on the side and fall in the water and drown. Some of our native bees use mud to build little, we'll call them little cabins for their eggs. So also if you want to attract native bees, you might want to put out some muddy water. And we can provide habitats. Now the upper left, that is a digger bee that we saw earlier. I can't really provide a habitat for him, but instead of covering every single piece of ground that I have with mulch, I could leave an area free for the native bees that uh, nest in the ground to make their tunnels. On the upper right, those are empty bamboo rods. Then on the lower left are rotted uh, branches that have been uh, drilled into holes so that a bee, instead of looking in nature for a crevice or a crack, could come to that branch and go into one of the holes and lay her eggs. If you were to buy a bumblebee box, this is what it looks like. Dry moss, grass clippings, shredded paper, or cotton batting. 
If you don't, I understand that bumblebees try and find some sort of hole in the ground by that a rodent may have dug and then they make that their colony. And here are the last four ways to attract pollinators. Plant multiples of the same plant in one or more locations. Don't dot the garden with single plants. Um, give, them, give the pollinators something to work with instead of having to search all over your garden for something else they like, put it all together. Plant a seasonal sequence of plants, spring, summer, and winter blooming. You wanna make sure that they have access to pollen throughout the season. Always plant in the sun if you're trying to apply, attract pollinators. And as we've said before, use minimal or no pesticides. Uh, people ask what they can plant in the spring. In my experience, um, ceanothus and manzanita, rosemary and lavender are about the first things to come in the spring. And then in the fall, gallardia, coneflower, asters, there's some possibilities. So then if you haven't heard about the UC Davis haagen Honey Bee Haven, it's a very cool place. Some time ago, haagen donated a good deal of money to start the Honey Bee Haven, but they no longer have any association with it. It's, um, it's on Bee Biology Road, located west of the UC Davis campus. It's open every day from dawn to dusk. We just open the gate and walk in. It's free of charge, free of bathrooms, free of water. So, you know, need to know how you feel before you go there. You can get self, uh, the tours are self-guided. If you want a tour, you need to have a group of 10 or more people and make arrangements in advance for the tour. So these photos are good examples of planting in large clusters. There's groupings here, here, and there's a lot of coneflower here and something red over here. It's not very big. You can walk it very easily and it's just stunning in the summer. I made my first trip in the fall, in late October, and there was hardly anything else in bloom except this great big Gallardia plant. I was walking through the garden and I could hear a lot of hum and buzz. Turned the corner and there was this Gallardia absolutely covered in bees. This is that valley, what did I call that? Uh, valley, it's way, way back. You saw it, it was the gold one. Oh, um, carpenter bee, the valley carpenter bee. And then the final thing that I have, no, one, one more slide. These are some of the habitats that they've provided for the native bees at the Honey Bee Haven. And I'll show you what I provided. I had my husband make this. We got the plans off the internet. Uh, it was made specifically for, a mason, for mason bees who like a 3 8 inch hole. So my husband put all the wood together, put on the roof, and then drilled three eighths, three eighths inch holes. Um, and then this is the front on the left and the back, which comes off via these screws. So that, if you take off the back, this is what it looks like. And this thing that looks like a hockey stick down on the bottom, which is um, my fault, sorry, didn't photograph very well and I had to stretch it out. I took parchment paper and wrapped it around a 3 8 inch dowel, slid both the dowel and with the parchment surrounding it into the hole, all the way in, pushed it all the way through to the back. These, uh, the depth of this house is six inches. So I made the dowel and the parchment paper maybe seven and a half inches so that when I pushed it through to the back, there was some hanging out. And the reason for that is the mason bee, if she comes into the hole, she likes to see that it's dark in the back. 
So I bend down the back of the parchment paper. Once I've got it in there and bent this down, then I pull out the dowel and every single hole is filled with parchment. So you ask yourself, why am I doing that? So if I didn't do that and the bees liked it and they filled up every hole, every empty hole, no parchment paper with eggs, or perhaps a spider wanted to live in one of the holes. By the time the eggs have matured and flown out um, as mason bees, they leave a lot of junk behind in the hole. The mason bee is one who uses mud to make these little enclosures and she drops an egg in each one and makes another enclosure out of mud and then another and another. So you can imagine how messy it gets in there. However, if you have a parchment piece in there, you just pull it out and the hole remains clean. So for the next season, you make more parchment paper and put it in again, keeping it clean all the time. Your other alternative to cleaning it, I don't know what, maybe getting some kind of brush and trying to brush it out. But um, you'll see that the roof has an overhang that's to protect um, from wind, not wind, sorry, from rain. Um, and I wanna warn you about buying a native bee house at uh, commercial locations. First of all, I don't know where the wood came from, whether it's been treated with anything. Um, I've never seen one where you can take off the back. So I ask myself, how do they clean it? Do they dump it in a bucket of bleach water? I have no idea how to clean this unless you can get the back off. They often don't have an overhang. So just think about it if you consider going to buy one at a, a Home Depot or any other store that might have these available. They had them at Costco for a while. Uh, I believe they were made in China. Um, uh, just be careful. If you have anyone in your family who has skill and could build you a very simple one from the internet, that might be a better thing to do. And that's all I have except for some more publicity for UC. Uh, if you wish to access year-round information, you can visit our website. You can follow us on social media. And if you live in Contra Costa County, you can email our help desk with your gardening questions. I'll leave that up just for a second if you want to write anything down. ccmg.ucanr.edu. And I think we have a little bit more. This is our webinar lineup, not Sloats. So we have left August growing citrus. September, soil in your home garden. October, fertilizers and amendments. And then uh, November, house plants. So that's what we'll be doing on YouTube coming up. And um, you can use uh, this QR code or the link that we've sent you. And uh, did you put that in the chat? Um, we have a link on the emails that they got, but the QR okay. code is a great way to access it too. Okay. And so we will mail a handout to those, I said already, to those who complete that within the next several weeks. Thank you very much. Yeah, I have some good questions um, to so kind of go with uh, for a little bit longer, but Ken, thank you for going through all these different tips and also just in, in, insightful information about all the uh, different kinds of pollinators that we can have and just maybe looking at them a little bit differently and looking out for them in your garden. Um, I have a really interesting one that might be a little more specific, but maybe some thoughts on it. Uh, we have someone who's interested in planting uh, lots of native plants to support, to support pollinators, which is a wonderful idea. Um, and they're actually wondering if you know maybe some good keystone species that some of the pollinators in this area might like. I know there's some specific plants that some of the pollinators really go for, but it's sometimes hard to know which ones are which. Uh, I am going to do something that? else. I'm going to refer uh, this question of this person to the California Native Plant Society. Mm. And you're going to get some information there. There are so many that my mind goes blank when I think about it. Like I know. some penstemon <laughs> are native, some penstemon aren't. 
some salvia, mm -hmm. some this and that. It's just all over the, the place. The has a few different ones. So yeah. I would try the California Native Plant Society for that information. Yeah, there's some really pretty butterflies that are native to the area that like some specific plants. And um, yeah, right. going to some of those more uh, vetted and really good lists is a good idea. The California Native Society is a great one to, to check you out. You know, the monarch is after um, the milkweed, the native mm -hmm. milkweed. Yeah, definitely. Um, then I have some other people on, do you have any advice maybe on going from a plant that is goes into full seed, like a, they have a cone flower that, that is producing seeds, but getting them to germinate is a little bit difficult. Have you heard anyone kind of with some tips about trying to germinate <laughs> plants from, from their seeding? No, that's not, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> okay. out of my scope. Yeah, it, it can be sometimes difficult. Sometimes seeds are hit or miss, but um, being diligent and, and trying to maybe hydrate them a little bit beforehand is what I've heard in the past. Um, I've but, heard about soaking beforehand. Is that what you mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then uh, someone's actually asking about your, your uh, I think it was a mason bee house, right? Uh, yep. mason bees. And they're wondering just like the, the length at which the holes are, maybe how long the dowel is compared to the parchment paper and how yes. they spaces. Um, the dowel, the back to, from the front to the back of the house is six inches in this particular house. So I would make the dowel the same length as the parchment paper. So maybe seven and a half or seven. You just want to get it through to the other side so it sticks out somewhat, the overhang, so you can pull it down. Does that make sense? Does that answer? I think so, yeah. So you want. Is, does it matter like how long that hole is for the mason bees? You feel like they're- I think they like six inches. Oh, yeah. and I forgot to say, uh, the, the women in the crowd will appreciate this. The uh, female mason bee lays the female eggs at the back of the house and she lays the males in the front. Um, I like to think it's because she's protecting the females, but I think uh, in reality, the males, because when things seem to warm up, the males come out of the house first and they kind of hang around outside waiting for the females to come out so they can all do their thing. So males out first and wait for the females. That's oh, just a little aside. So if you were to make a smaller house, it doesn't have to be, well, could be six inches back because she likes six inches. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be enormous like this. This is like a skyscraper. <laughs> Would you be able to go back to the slide that has the QR code for a little bit longer? I think some yeah, people sure. like to to use that as a, a reference. Just see if that works. Thank you, yeah, <laughs> um, perfect. And then I think we are, definitely have some a uh, little more specific questions here and there. And I definitely would like, uh, if anyone has some more specific plants they wanna talk about, come into the stores, we'd love to talk to you about it. We are really promoting uh, native pollination this month. I think at the very end of the month, we have our native pollinator week at all of our slope locations. So we're gonna be packed up with those plants and be ready to talk to you about which ones would do well in your garden. Um, a lot of native ones do great anywhere here in the California area, so they are wonderful plants to plant. Um, our stores are also super full of lots of really fun, beautiful blooming plants right now. So if you just want to take a stroll in the garden that has lots of fun flowers and maybe they'll pick up some to bring home with you, definitely come to any of our stores. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you about them. Uh, but it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Liz. It was Thank uh, you. good talk. And